I am very honored to be introducing to you Orit Hafshi. Um, you know, in the context of the hurricane, um, I'm thinking even more about uh, the way Orit's imagery of destruction and reconstruction, of loss and renewal, seems to speak to our condition, uh, not just in Pennsylvania, but worldwide. Her images reflect upon both natural and social upheaval, uh, but they also convey qualities of vision and persistence that offer the prospect of sustenance, interconnection, and transcendence. I'm pleased to very, very briefly touch on these themes because she will do so more eloquently, but um, I first want to thank some of the people who've helped her realize this exceptional vision here in the List Gallery. Uh, first of all, someone extremely important who couldn't be here tonight is um, Nitai Hafshi, mm -hmm. Orit's husband. He is a talented filmmaker, uh, a brilliant thinker, and he has been her collaborator, um, technical support. He's, he's been her partner in every way, and everyone I know wishes they had a Nitai. Um, he's, he's a remarkable person, and I think we'll just have to see his presence felt in the magic that is that inner room of the gallery. Uh, the work is called Convergence. I also want to give a very special thank you to Betsy Lee. Will you stand up, Betsy? Please. <laughs> Betsy's been a volunteer with the gallery for several years, and she has really allowed List Gallery projects to aspire to a higher level. And I really am grateful for her ongoing support and expertise. And also, Doug Heron couldn't be here today. I don't see him. He has a new baby. But he <laughs> helped us redesign the lights uh, for this show. Tom Snyder helped me unpack the crate. And um, Jim Murphy also gave us invaluable theatrical expertise. I also want to thank uh, some students, Liz Laplace, our gallery intern, Francesca Bolfo, and Su Min Kim who are also really my A-team of uh, gallery curatorial staff who are focusing on um, lots of different things this year, but uh, they were, they've been instrumental in the show. And uh, many other students have chipped in along the way. It really does take a lot of teamwork to realize something um, and make it look easy. The only reason our teamwork works is because Orit's vision and her attention to detail is so uh, unparalleled. Um, thus, I'm very, very grateful to the William J. Cooper Foundation for the opportunity to pursue this exhibition. Um, it's been a couple of years researching it and organizing it, working with Orit, and uh, it's not often, even here at Swarthmore, that I have the chance to steal such a bright and rising star from the art heavens. Um, Orit's resume shows you a little bit of that uh, celestial achievement. Uh, she went to um, Neri Bloomfield Academy of Design in Haifa, in Israel, where she grew up. Uh, she then attended the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia, and she received a master's uh, from the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. And she has uh, been exhibiting uh, internationally for some time. Uh, her solo exhibitions have taken place at the Open Museum in Tefen, uh, Gallery 39, Tel Aviv the Print Center in Philadelphia, the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, by Art Projects, Tel Aviv, and many, I could go on, and her group exhibitions too have been at many distinguished venues. Most recently, she was a, a featured artist in Philographica 2010, The Graphic Unconscious, which um, had one of its flagship shows at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts last year. The Academy awarded her the 2010 Distinguished Alumni Award, and she also, in 2010, received the Israel Museum's uh, Jacob Pins Awards, which is for a distinguished Israel, Israeli printmaker, given only two years. Um, and she just received that. She's in many museum uh, collections worldwide, and her work has also been shown abroad in Germany, the Czech Republic, um, Ireland, uh, Many, many other locations. Um, she's highly regarded as a printmaker, uh, but one of my hopes in this show was to highlight the versatility of her work. Our exhibit, uh, titled Resilience, features not only key works that have never been shown before in the US, um, but 
the variety of her practice, which ranges from the ink painting on the, on the long first wall. We have um, a rubbing um, in touche stick, uh, which is uh, also on the window wall. Opposite that is a carved and painted wood assemblage with many different panels with um, a variety of media on it. Um, and uh, also uh, woodcut prints. And in the inner room installation, and uh, one of her, uh, you know, one of many increasing uh, forays into three dimensions. Uh, Orit uh, has always worked in a variety of medium. We aren't um, big enough to show also that she works in monoprints, and she has um, many. She's always worked in pastel as well. Uh, a little bit about her biography, Orit is the daughter of two Holocaust survivors who helped found Mutsu Matsuva, which is one of Israel's first kibbutzim. You're going to correct my pronunciation, I hope. She grew up, of course, <laughs> witnessing conflicts over land and ideology which were written in the changing boundaries and ecology of the country. But her art seeks commonalities of experience rather than divisions, and uh, these commonalities transcend nationalism or sectarianism. Uh, the ruined walls that you see in so many of her works, works such as Uprise in the gallery, stand as universal symbols of loss and absence, the uphill struggle to find one's place in a fractured, fractured world. And her other titles, I think, also reflect her concern with archetypes um, of the human condition. Um, Addressing the prevalence of violence and dislocation in the world, she asserts the need for reflection and persistence and understanding. And her work abounds uh, not just with talent and drive, but with empathy. Uh, and I, this was, I had the privilege of meeting her about 25 years ago, because I went to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. I was a year ahead of her. And right from the start, I knew Ori was somebody I wanted to get to know. Uh, she, she really stood out uh, from the rest with her, um, her kind of visionary imagination. Um, even then she was well on her way to um, developing her signature processes and uh, one could see that she was already drawn to um, artists like Durer and Titian, Kathy Kolwitz. Um, at the time there was a retrospective of Anselm Kiefer at the PMA that made a huge impression. Um, and she was here in the U.S. to really broaden her awareness of contemporary art. Even in those student days, she was working on huge um, woodcuts um, made with um, pine boards glued edge to edge into very large matrices. And the dark knots and the varied grain of the wood, the imperfections of the wood, were part of what she was seeking. They gave rise to a richly textured imagery of rocks and clouds. And one can still see, um, what was already there, I think, um, a kind of alchemy at work in which the elements transform. And the wood grain evokes water currents. And watery brush strokes uh, would evoke uh, angular branches. Um, broader swirls of wood grain would become clouds. And so thus, uh, gouge marks would become white caps. Uh, her work is always morphing into something else, both within its imagery and as you see, components of her work recombine into larger, different pieces. Uh, rather than use a mechanical press, I'm sure she'll talk about how she hand prints her work only, never using assistance. And as she do so, does show that she can kind of be attentive to nuance. And it's really remarkable, I think, to see an artist who works so large, really on a monumental scale, be so attentive to nuance and not just use easy um, techniques for going big. Um, but she, she touches each part of the work, both in its making and its remaking. And in doing so, she invests it with a kind of passion and that empathy that contrasts with that heroic scale and brings it back down to the humanity that is within us and that's kind of affirmed by her work. So I, I've always appreciated how visionary her work is, how impressive it is. But it wasn't until I had the opportunity to visit her in Israel last year, thanks to the Cooper Foundation, that I appreciated the realism of her work. I thought it was all, <laughs> I mean, I really, it felt like so much imagination. And it was a privilege to follow her through the country. She drove us around. 
and to see how uh, history, not only history and current events, but also the terrain of Israel has affected her, her imagery. Uh, her neighborhood in Herzliya is very, um, is filled with construction projects, archaeology sites, Bauhaus uh, architecture, and crumbling facades. It's really diverse in its surface and texture. Um, and the country as a whole is like that. She took me to Masada, where many of you may have heard of Masada, one of Israel's symbols of conquest, serial habitation, abandonment. Um, it's where the Jewish zealots reportedly committed suicide rather than be captured by the Romans. And subsequently, the Byzantines created uh, places of worship there. Those became ruins. And today, you see all these ruins mingled with tourist um, structures, um, archaeological sites, uh, cliffs in the distance. And in the distance, you also see not only the uh, ribbons of winding road in the siege camp ruins, but the, the Dead Sea, where the waters are receding because of the overuse of water. And so you just see a, a carpet of salt across the desert. Um, so one sees the past and present change mingling there. And it's so apropos to the kind of uh, dynamism and presence of her work, that kind of imagery. And similarly, up in uh, the north of Israel, near Lebanon, uh, where the caverns and ravines speak not only of geological uplift, but the story of war, um, you know, where attacks and counterattacks were, you know, mentioned, and the names of the dead and missing are, are written or on the tips of everyone's tongue. Um, and in the Golan Heights, uh, we went and Israel and uh, Orit served there as part of her mandatory service. And there, uh, you know, the, the, the terrain and the, the rocks are very different. It's very volcanic. And the distinctive basalt rocks look very much like the rocks in her, her pictures in the gallery. They're very different from the basalt, I mean, from the, um, the limestone rocks you see elsewhere. And uh, she's very attentive to that. And those rocks, if you get out of your car, and you can't go walk on them because they're next to mine. So uh, when you look at the terrain, there's a kind of inviting curiosity that it arouses. Um, but there's also, the, there, it's a place one cannot really enter. And one sees that paradox, I think, in her work, where one, one wants to enter, <coughs> the perspective is so strong. But there's also a way in which it's problematized as so much of our land is problematized today. So I will let her uh, carry on from here, but I feel, and I'm sure if you've seen her work already, that her creativity and ever-changing surfaces really both confront that reality that is so daunting, uh, but it also, because of the depth of her engagement and her persistence and her sense of touch, her empathy, there is uh, within that uh, something that can lead us forward and, and uh, overcome the kind of paralysis that might otherwise result. Um, her vision, I think, is very much defined by the fact that she's an Israeli, but her works speak to us all and on all levels. I am very proud to give you a Reid Hofshi. Andrea was just continuing speaking about my work because she's doing it the best. Um, <laughs> um, I will apologize for my English, but I think I probably am right that uh, my uh, English is better than most of your Hebrew. So <laughs> I'll come down about it and whatever happens, happens. Um, should we take off the lights, please? I just wanted really to thank you, Andrea for this collaboration, I mean, it's really rare uh, to have a chance to collaborate with a curator uh, like Andrea. Um, and I feel very lucky and I thank you. And I thank you for the Cooper Foundation, of course, but the close relationship that we developed through. Uh, we had it at the Academy already, but it's, um, it's been a real gift for me, this show. Uh, so I thank you and I thank all the students here that you know helped us as well. And, um, and, you know, I will just start, start and, you know, I, I think that, um, 
was thinking, what should I talk about here in this talk? And I thought, well, I'll just take you through a journey um, of my creation in the last, I would say, um, 10 years or so, thinking uh, that this will give you a picture of the source of my creation and and what I do in my studio. Um, so this work is called uh, Paleo Leo, and it's 2002, and it is a spoon-printed woodcut on Okawara paper. Um, in this talk, I would like to give you some you know, technical information as well as conceptual ones, because I realized that you know, um, my works has a lot of you know, uh, uh, media questions about it, so I will feel free to, you know, to move from one subject to another. And, um, and I think that this piece represents uh, my first work uh, since I came back to Israel that is really, um, that, you know, that really, you know, opened the door to the next 10 years. Um, for a while I was a little bit uh, paralyzed with my art working because uh, I decided that uh, life is uh, the most important thing, and so I decided to have kids. So I have three kids at home. I know that uh, to be an artist and have three kids is something that is rare. And um, so for a while, I really devoted my time for my kids. And they, when they grew up a little, I started working again. I didn't have a studio, so I just worked at home <laughs> with these wood panels. Uh, so this is a, a spoon-printed uh, woodcut, and as you see already, uh, I, I carve on pine wood, and I just put together uh, pine, uh, pine, pine strips, and I just carve into it. Um, Um, just for your knowledge, I, I do woodcut, so it is a print, but since my uh, use of printmaking is um, just a media for my expression, I don't print very much uh, in edition. I would print maybe four of each edition. It's not about the numbers of uh, the printed image, rather about the, the, the media that allows myself to express it. Um, I have to tell you that my origin of creation is drawing. If you know, if we know artists that are painters and sculptors, I think of drawing. So everything is about drawing. So I would uh, draw on wood, and I would draw into the wood using wood uh, woodcut carving tools. Once in a while, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll show you, you know, the terrain uh, that I'm inspired by. Um, generally speaking, I'm inspired, I think, by three uh, sources. One is um, traveling around in Israel and abroad. Of course, it's, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for these places that I will travel to that will be in, in on many occasions with extreme terrain rugged terrain. Um, so it's a lot of it is my photography, like this one, and you will see many of my photographs here. All, all the photographs that you will see are mine. And um, the other uh, source would be uh, the current events in Israel. Well, you have to realize that growing up in Israel is not something for granted. For those of you who don't know Israel, Israel is smaller than New Jersey. I know that in the news it sounds like Israel is the size of the United States and Europe together, but um, it's a tiny, tiny place that is trying to survive and is trying to have the right to live. Um, so uh, um, uh, the current events are very, um, you know, they affect me very much. I, I, I kind of like, I, I feel like that, that, that it's impossible to be an artist in Israel and not acknowledge and uh, consider the events there. It's like, how do you think of fantasy when you have such, you know, uh, present life with so much political events 
and traumas. So, so for me, you know, there was no way I would ignore it. And you, I, I will show you later on. And the third thing that is uh, inspiring me is my imagination. So whenever you look at my work, it's never about a, a scenario that happened and um, uh, was taken for, from a paper clip, a newspaper clip, rather a collage of uh, my photographing and the events and my imagination. So this is, just for your knowledge, this is Mount Hermon. This is uh, the terrain in Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon sits on the border between Israel, Lebanon, and Syria. Interesting. Just think, just think of what's happening uh, these days in Egypt and, and uh, Syria and Lebanon and Jordan. These are all the countries that are surrounding Israel. A woodcut. Um, it's called Reminiscence. 2005 spoon printed woodcut on Okawara paper and um, I think that it is important for me to stress out that I'm very much interested in the format that I'm working. Um, I do teach a lot and when I give an assignment I always think, oh, please don't come with an A4 size work, you know, try to think differently, try to think beyond the, 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 the paper that comes from the printer. And uh, so I'm very aware of shape of, a, of an art of work. It allows me to expand uh, the subject matter uh, uh, the way I want. So this one, this one, for example, is 140 by uh, 71 inches. And, um, and it's printed just for you know technical reason. Um, my my studio is very very small, and I have a table that kind of like fills the whole studio, so I can um, print it in sections. Uh, how do you do this? Okay, so I have four, I have four sections here. So it's one, two, three, and four sections, and each section is um, is a wood block that is built out of four stripes of pine wood that I put together ahead of time. Um, I do print it in sections, and then I just put the paper together to the, to the piece. And you will see that fragmentation is something that is very inherent to my, uh, my work. In 2004, I was invited uh, to do a piece, a new piece for the Herzliya Museum of Art. Um, there are few great museums in Israel, uh, but the top ones are, would be, of course, the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, uh, the Tel Aviv Museum in Tel Aviv, and the most progressive for contemporary art museum is the Herzliya Museum for Contemporary Art. Um, so I was invited to do another, a new work, and that was the first time that I needed to move from the two dimension into the three dimension. And naturally, I thought, okay, the, the, the wood blocks are already something that is semi three dimension. Right, it's like a, a relief, but it's semi three dimension. So it could become a sculptural object at its own, as independent object. Um, but then, you know, I had a very, I had to think it very carefully because it's very easy just to draw on the wood. Oops. <laughs> I think it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. yeah. Just to draw on the wood, carve it, and say, oh gosh, it's beautiful, I'll leave it that way. But as an artist, I think that you should be responsible for what you want to say and how you want to say, and not just leave it just because it's beautiful. So I was very critical about it, and I didn't want to, to, uh, to just to um, 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 exhibit the carved wood blocks without thinking it as an, an, an independent object. Uh, so therefore, these wood blocks could not be printed for a woodcut. If you try to, wood, to print them, Sure, you can draw, you know, ink on it and put a paper and rub it, but the result will not be a good result because it was not thought to be a woodcut. It was thought to be an, a, a sculptural piece, a, an individual, a independent piece. So just so you see the scale of me in that, this is called, um, 
datum collectinea. I think that with my names you will realize that there is a lot of uh, raising more questions with the names than giving answers with the names. You know, doing my art, I cannot give an answer to anything. I think that my role as an artist is to raise questions rather than to give answers. I don't have answers for anything. Um, so, um, and it, so it's called datum collectanea, collecting collecting datum. And um, if you will look carefully, you will see that there are there is a group of thirteen people here, uh, kind of wandering around, searching, and. Um, and I won't give you the clue what are they searching for. I think that it's up to you to realize what are they searching for. I, I can tell you that in Israel it's very obvious what people think that they are searching for, but I can also tell you that it's not always my um, m m a, m the reason that I'm searching for. This is just for your knowledge. This is made out of um, 18 panels. Uh, it is mostly drawing and carved wood blocks. So what this piece allows me for the oops, sorry, sorry, for the first time, uh, I, I I really left many parts of the area as the original drawing. So therefore, it, you can't even uh, uh, print it because it's not carved to give a result of a printed matter. It's the original drawing. So here I, I combine the drawing and the carving, yet it's not to be printed. But as you know, uh, there is a history of art uh, behind me, and uh, I'm very aware of it, very, very aware of it. And so this is Titian, and it's called the Red Sea, and it's a woodcut, and it's um, uh, uh, 87 inches by 4.9 inches, and um, it was done in 1515. So just imagine, you know, we always think, oh gosh, we are so brilliant and we invent new things. Hey, we don't. <laughs> we can add a small, small word to this long sentence that has been created through the years. Um, so, uh, as you can realize, I'm very much influenced uh, by his work, by, by this woodcut, though it's done com completely different than mine. Mine are much more expressive, etc. These are much more uh, precisely cut, uh, and the narrative is very, um, you know, um, um, it's it, uh, full of details, etc., etc., etc. But it's definitely in my mind when I do this, and you will see it even later uh, uh, in a more uh, definite way. Uh, so as I said, it's called the Red, uh, the Red Sea. And, um, and if you're talking about the Red Sea, and when I think about the Red Sea, I think about less about the miracle and much more about migration of people and the need to migrate from one place to another just to survive. Uh, it happens in the world these days, everywhere. Um, so, so Andrea mentioned them all already, and those are really, I consider them my family, you know, Titian. <laughs> He's my great, 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 great. And this is Anselm Kiefer, of course. Uh, it's called the Red Sea. And for those who don't, uh, that are not familiar with the works of um, and Slim Kiefer, I really, really recommend. Um, it's interesting how much I'm drawn to German artists through the years. It's very interesting. I have to sometimes, maybe one day I will write something about it. It's, um, uh, so uh, this, this is called uh, the Red Sea also. It was made uh, in 1984 to 85, and it is uh, a mixed media that includes a oil emulsion and shellac on photograph mounted on canvas with woodcut and lead. And it is um, 109 by 167 inches. So it's huge and um, it's so interesting for me to see the interpretation of, of Titian uh, to the Red Sea and the uh, interpretation of uh, Anselm Kiefer uh, to the same subject matter. matter. And uh, 
And this is just a, um, a photograph of me in front of my, one of my works uh, when I laid it on the floor, just so you see. This is, um, uh, it, it's called Terra Incognita. And um, it is a 2007 a grease pencil rubbing on Suzuki paper. And that is the work. And as you see, um, just I, I realized that, you know, all these wood blocks that I have in my studio uh, are not finished uh, with their say. And I realized that I could really bring back the drawing by rubbing wood blocks that I already exhibited. So this piece is, was rubbed out of the Dayton Collector Nea uh, huge work. And I just rubbed a part of it, of course, and I created the shape uh, that gives it a completely new meaning. But also, it, uh, it brings back the drawing that was lost um, a, while printing, though a, a Dayton Collector Nea was not printed. So um, I think that what's, what attracted me here is because I'm dealing with time. I, I'm dealing with past time and present time. I don't know what the future holds for us, but I definitely I am aware of past and current time. But this action of rubbing, uh, this is a lot of work to work. To work. This, is, this piece is um, 103 by 207 inches. So uh, to rub it takes a lot of time, as and as you see, you can really see, you know, this is this is how, this is my hand movement. So time is much emphasized through my re-rubbing it on my wood blocks. So I first draw it on the wood block, and then I carve it, and then I, if I do rubbing, I add. So time is invested uh, conceptually and physically in my work. Here we see how it is installed in the museum. And uh, at the back here, oops, sorry. And at the back here you will see a piece of work that we'll see in a minute. Uh, it's a plus shape or an upside down cross. Uh, so we'll talk about it later. Um, but I would like to introduce you to those who don't know him, uh, uh, the painter Michael Bormans. Um, Michael Bormans is a Belgian artist, Belgian art, a, a painter that I'm, I'm really, really, uh, I admire his work. But what I admire, it's called The Barn, and it's 2003 oil on canvas. Um, as a matter of fact, he was trained uh, as a filmmaker, though he is a brilliant painter, uh, to, in my point of view, you know. But what's, what I'm drawn here is the realization that there is a moment here. You don't really know what this person is focusing on. You can, you can think, but it's not... You know, it's not elaborated on what exactly, what does he do? It's that moment that really, you know, um, that, you know, doesn't give all the answers of what does he think and what does he do and where, etc., etc. And um, so in my work, that this piece of work is called Keros. Keros means moment. I'm talking about this exact moment. And, um, oops. Just a sec, just a sec. Sorry, guys. Bear with me. And so this person here is doing something that I'm not sure what. And this guy here is running behind. And so each one is doing his own thing, though they are in the same forest and, uh, and place. Um, And it's called Chaos, and it is a 2006 ink drawing, markers, and acrylic on carved pine wood panels. And just to let you know, I really, I know that there are all kinds of rules in the printmaking, painting, drawing world. Well, there are no rules. And you know, the only rules that I have in my mind is not to break any moral rules. 
doing art, use whatever media you want, know the media, but use it the way you want, explore it, don't listen to this is not the way and this is not the way. If you're not harming anyone, go ahead and do it. That's the way I develop my art. And I have been, I heard people saying in museum, looking at my art and saying, oh, it's not allowed to do so. So what did I do? Did they murder anybody? I did artwork. Why isn't it allowed? It's allowed. And go ahead and explore it. But, don't, but be moral. And don't ruin anybody's, and respect the, 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 the other, and do whatever you want. This piece is a rubbing uh, that was taken from uh, this part of the work, okay? So here I am, just rubbing parts of the wooden block, and this is the result of it. So this is called a rally, and it's 2007 grease pencil rubbing on Suzuki paper. You know, Suzuki paper is gone from the world. Unfortunately, uh, I had when I was a student, I went and bought the best materials. I didn't. I I, I don't drink a beer. I don't uh, drink wine. I just buy paper. So I went really, you know, water and paper. You know, I'm coming from this like dry country, and all I want is water. <laughs> so. Um, I, I didn't spend the money on beer, and I went and bought the best paper. So this is Suzuki paper, and I, and I had seven pieces of Suzuki paper left when I moved back to Israel, and I really waited for the moment that it will be the best for me to explore a new media and do this, and I don't have Suzuki anymore. I, it's one of those things that you know, you get used to this excellent paper, and then the person who makes it in Japan dies, and there is no one that will continue it. So then you have to search for a new paper, and you do so because you don't have other choice, which is fine. Uh, but this was. <laughs> I did find, and I will talk about it. Yes, I did find, I found an excellent solution. <laughs> so, but as you know, you know, I'm living in Israel, and uh, this is called witnessing. I, have, I don't have to, uh, it's written here. And so, many people ask me, so what are they witnessing? And I will not give you the answer, of course. As I told you before, it's not about what they are witnessing, it's about the fact that they are witnessing something horrible. Um, and you know, it's very interesting, I have all these like little stories, it's like, this work, because it, it was printed in some of the Israeli newspapers, and it happens to me that people are, uh, uh, feel like a, a, a uh, sometimes that they, they they feel close to these like uh, people that are in my works, so I got email from this woman asking me if I saw her picture in the newspaper and and I made her because she was so she thought it, it, it is herself. So it's like so that's a great compliment for me when people have this uh, emotion towards a, a portrait or an, an image of a, of a person that I'm drawing and they feel that it's them, that's a great honor for me. And, 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 and so that's what happened with them. This is, uh, it's all carved. You can't see that it's carved because uh, the uh, photography flattens it, but it's all carved like the piece that uh, uh, is in the gallery. So reality, huh? So they are witnessing reality. So this is just one picture. We have so many of them every day. So this is from the third intifada in 2000 in Israel. And believe me, believe me, it's very, very, very difficult uh, to be um, to witness and to be involved in uh, a place where nations cannot live together. And uh, I belong to this group of people that would do anything to solve the problem and uh, to have peace. Unfortunately, uh, we say it so many years that hopefully when we are 18, uh, or the kids are 18, they will not have to go to mandatory army, and it's still not happened yet. Uh, I'm still hopeful. I can't lose hope. 
we have to keep hope and try, of course. So, um, so when these things happen, because you know my works are time consuming, it takes a lot of time to create them. I, I do very little uh, works during a year. Um, but then, you know, I feel anxious to respond to these events. And I can't wait that it will take me three months to create a piece. So I developed a new way to respond to it in a much quicker way, kind of like a sketchbook where you see something and you respond to it. And so I created this um, a series of uh, works that calls there are monotypes and uh, and and create a, a fast response to current events. So, as you see, 38 by 50, it's much larger here. <laughs> um, and it's called Passage. I don't have to explain, right? Uh, so, just for your knowledge, um, this part is transfer drawing monotype, and this part is a woodcut that was printed. And technically what I do is a transfer drawing monotype is you just roll an ink on a glass, you put the paper on top of the glass and you draw at the back of the paper. So it picks up all this ink. It picks up the ink, not always equally. There is a lot of either happy or sad accidents, but you take it from there because that's, the, that's this media. You can't really control it. You can't be a, 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 a control freak doing this transfer drawing monotypes. You have to accept that it might not be the best drawing or the way that you wanted it, but it is. And what I did after I finished it, I blocked it with um, uh, with transparent uh, 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 mm, adhesive paper, and I printed the rest of it here. And here, for example, just for your knowledge, I just took a brush because I didn't have all this pattern, so I just took a brush and imitated the rest of it to fit my needs. Okay, so it's all about invention. Yes, this is called, just a sec, uh, this, this is called Fright, 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 <coughs> yeah, Fright, I don't know how to say it. Um, again, transfer drawing, monotype, and woodcut on paper. I think that I don't have to say um, this is a woodcut. And the rest is transfer drawing monotype. And as you see, there is a red here and in the other one too. Yes, um, I have eliminated color for most of my works, believe it or not. But that's because I realized that using color, you really have to think why do you use color, where, and when. You don't just use color just because it is nice. And I realized that I express my subject matter from white to black with all the ranges, in, with all the colors in between. So it is colorful already. I mean, black and white is not not colorful. Black and white could be very colorful. And if I would just, you know, adhere color to that, it might ruin it. Just to add something on top of it that was already, you know, uh, solved. So I limited, uh, in most of my works, the color, except for my portraits, my very large portraits, but I'm, I'm, I won't talk about it today. Um, this is Kathy Colvitz, of course. Uh, it's called The End. You know, Kathy Colvitz is one of my mothers. You know, really. Um, I look at her work. I. Um, I learned her work. She's a role model for me. Um, she, uh, she died in 1945. She lost a son in the war and she lost a grandson in the war. Um, she was a mother of four. She was a mother, an artist, uh, a humanist. Uh, she understood the, uh, the people around her. She comes from a uh, I think that her husband was a doctor, yeah, from a, a medical doctor. So, and uh, she just, you know, she, and she was the most gifted draftsman, I mean, a drawer. I mean, she, there was no one that could, you know, really uh, um, get better than her. And if you have time and you go to Berlin, please 
go to this tiny museum that is called the Katy Kollwitz Museum. Katy Kollwitz is, is very, very appreciated all over Berlin. There is a neighborhood and a street calls after, after her uh, museum, uh, sculptures around the town, of course. Um, and sh for me, I mean, she is like the. Um, discern. This looks like hurricane, right? <laughs> it's, it's a political hurricane. Transport. And you will see this figure. Just notice this figure here. Extricate. Transfer drawing only with no with no uh, woodcut in it. Yeah, you know these checkups at the borders. Wow, they need to be checked up when you want to cross a border. It's very sad. Kathy Kovitz again. The volunteers. That's a woodcut. Very strong woodcut. Her woodcuts are very, very strong. I didn't know, I didn't want to put too many, but I, I couldn't avoid her work, you know, I just, she's, you know, I, I literally sleep with her, with a book about her works next to my bed in the last 25 years. I don't know it from there. <coughs> Asunder. So this is the same woman that you saw just, you know, a few images ago in a different composition. Since it's a woodblock and it's there, so you could use it to compose a new sentence. Disillusionment. Transfer drawing and woodcut. Bottom line. And you know, it's very difficult on me, all these events in Israel, to both sides, as a matter of fact. I'm considering the Palestinians and uh, us as Israeli, you know, as equal in that way. So I feel sorry for both nations equally, of course, um, because we both are being terrorized by each other because that, you know, it's, it's, it's a mutual terrorism. Uh, there is no one side that is uh, uh, right. Uh, better than the other, believe me. Um, and so I can't deal with it all the time because otherwise I think I will become insane. I really can't. It's just too hard on me. Uh, so then I will zoom in or zoom out to another subject matter that will be, not that this is not expressive and it's called flash, um, but that are not as direct as the monotypes and uh, this is a spoon printed woodcut on Okawara paper 61 by 72 trail 2004 spoon printed woodcut on Okawara paper And uh, so, I told you I'm traveling to these places that I choose very carefully. So Iceland, hey, go for there. You don't know how beautiful this place is. It's the most beautiful place on earth, Iceland. I felt I was, I, 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 I should have belonged there. It's like, you know, I was born in Israel, no water, hot as can be. <laughs> and I just wanted to be, you know, in August, it's like, you know, 30 degrees in August. So it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Beautiful. Look how much water. I mean, I just want a little bit of that. Gosh. That's what's, that's the creation of Earth. It's a basalt, of course, you know, stone. So those events could be very small events on Earth that will become 
a huge creation in my art. I don't need uh, spectacular scenes uh, to create these monumental images. I could look at a tiny event on, on the floor and that will become something that will be larger than you know, this screen. And during this, my travels, I do sketch in the book. Uh, you know, there are artists that, are, that sketch all the time. I don't sketch all the time, but I love sketching. It just, you know, I, I really do love sketching, um, and I keep the sketchbook with me, uh, especially when I travel. When I travel with my family, it's much more difficult. But here I got a chance to spend a month in Ireland at, at, in Ireland at the Banning Glen Art Foundations, where, where many people from here spend time there. And uh, so I was, I was able to draw in my sketchbook. So just sketches. Yeah, Ellie, do you read what's written there? Uh -uh. It's personal, yeah, Ellie. <laughs> she reads my Hebrew. <laughs> I'm so happy you can't read it. <laughs> um, and this is, of course, Durell. Albrecht Durell. He is like, you know, the, the, um, where am I? I'm sorry, just a second. Okay, give me a sec. I lost my track of my information. This is called a rocky landscape. Um, sorry, girls. has to be this one. Okay, I don't have it. Okay, it's somewhere here, believe me. Uh, Rocky Landscape um, by Albert Dürer. It's one of these like drawings, ink drawings, and as you will see, uh, I'm very influenced by the way he draws. Uh, uh, so, therefore, And when I spend time in other places, I'm very interested in what's happening there, in their communities over there. And so I always buy the newspaper. And, uh, you know, I, I was there for a month, with, uh, and uh, it's a tiny, tiny place. The newspapers there don't have this, like, major events like we have in Israel in their newspaper. So it was kind of interesting how I was able to pull from these tiny moments, this bigger event, bigger artwork. And, and, and but this picture really drew my attention because I saw this man standing and pointing to himself and I thought to myself, oh my God, if we could only point the fingers towards ourselves and ask ourselves what wrong did we do rather than point it on the other. And, and I just took this clip of the pay, a, a, a newspaper clip and uh, just, you know, adhered it to me, um, my uh, a sketchbook, knowing that it will become part of a work in the future. Um, but before that, I just want to show you, it, I will come back to that, but this is Anna Tijo's work. Anna Tichos is my Israeli mother. Uh, she, uh, not really nice. She's an artist um, that was uh, born in Czechoslovakia and uh, immigrated to Israel in the 20s and uh, uh, was and is considered still today the best and the strongest drawer in, in Israel. Uh, she uh, studied um, in Austria um, with all the uh, Austrian uh, artist uh, Egon Schiele, Kokoschka, Klimt, of course. Uh, so the line drawing is uh, very uh, evident here. Uh, and she is, you know, I, I, I learn a lot from her. Ireland. Ireland. And, and then when I came back from Ireland, I was uh, asked for, by the Israeli Museum uh, to create a new work, and I said to the curator, wow, thank you for inviting me, but I would like to do something I haven't done before. And she said, go ahead. 
go for it, do something you haven't done before. So I decided to, for the first time, to put together all my media. So it's drawing and drawing on the wood and printing into it and create a symphony of my work. Uh, and it is called Upon This, uh, uh, sh upon this Bank and Shawl of Time. And, um, uh, and it's a large work, and um, without mentioning another great artist, William Cambridge, uh, that uh, is really influential on me, uh, a South African artist, uh, um, 56 years old or something like that, uh, that grew up in uh, uh, Johannesburg in apartheid, uh, apartheid time, um, and uh, he is expressing uh, all his uh, ideas and uh, questions uh, using drawing as a media for animation movies and uh, spectacular drawings uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, theater uh, stages, etc., etc. Drawing, for me it's a comic relief to just draw, so drawings, my drawings. Richard Long, wandering around and making circles. No land artist. Beautiful. Gash, a combination. It's a tall work. Oh, this is the size of it. This is the real size. It's a combination of drawing and woodcut uh, on the upper and bottom part and going into it. So I just, you know. Here is the inspiration for that. So we saw the castle, and this, we just saw the photograph of this area, so you know where it all comes from. It's a collage of all kinds of places. And you saw this one, so I wanted to talk to you about it. This is, um, uh, this is um, a, a building that probably uh, reminds many people of a holy place. Um, it's very rare that I will combine personal stories in my artwork just because I feel that to, if I do combine personal stories, it becomes, I can't be critical enough about it. And it's important to me to, be, to keep being critical about what I say and how do I say it. So, but, you know, it, get, it got to a point that I had to express it. So, just for your knowledge, this is uh, a leftover, it's no longer the wall of the synagogue, uh, one of the most beautiful synagogues uh, in, in uh, Czechoslovakia, um, in my mom's town, Holeshov, uh, in Morava. Uh, and uh, um, it was, uh, my mom used to live right here, and the house, of course, is no longer there. Just, just so you know, my mom is the only a living Jew from that town, um, uh, and this was taken, uh, the, the picture was taken the day that the Czech took this wall down because no Jews were there anymore, so there was no reason to fix it or something, either to rebuild it. Um, and um, uh, But I found this, and I think that this is very important for me to, to tell you, that I found this image in a thesis of a student, of a Czech student on the internet, a Czech student that did her um, thesis in education, and her thesis dealt with the uh, disappearing community, Jewish community in Holeshov. Just happened to be my mom's town, and I, because I'm obsessive about finding information about what happened there, um, I I found this on the internet, and I had to um, just um, do something with it. So it's the same day. Here they are destroying what's left there. You can see that it was uh, very much gothic. Uh, and so this is the original work, my response to it. And in the gallery, you will see um, uh, this work, uh, which is actually uh, uh, a duplication of uh, <coughs> this part three times. One, two, three. So as you see, it, I was able to kind of like expand the whole uh, landscape and, uh, and create my, and something, uh, I don't know what to say, whatever.
<laughs> so difficult to speak in English, believe me. And uh, I mentioned already uh, Anselm Kiefer, and uh, you know, um, and Kiefer is one of these artists. He was born in 1945. Interesting, you know, the end of the Second World War, and he, he for for all his life, he's been asking. Uh, what is it about his nation that brought them to do what they did in Second World War? And um, so for me, he's a role model again. Um, and um, this is about uh, a sacrifice. This is, uh, this is called, oops, sorry. This is called uh, grain. And it's a woodcut uh, that is uh, reflecting one of the scenes of uh, Wagner's opera. Um, uh, this woman that her beloved one, uh, that her lover uh, killed, was killed just there, uh, is riding her horse into the flames. Something that I wouldn't agree. I mean, I think that we should not sac sacrifice our life in any way, not even in Metzada, which is interesting. Uh, that's what's happened there. I mean, they sacrificed their life instead of. But so uh, I doubt that action. But so, just so you see, the shape and everything. Um, so here is an, my work, another work of mine that is this shape. It's called Vis Vitalis, um, the power of life. And um, just for your knowledge, this, this is my mom. And it's almost life size. And so it's a drawing and woodcut and everything. And one day I will tell you the story. I just don't have the time, but it's a personal one. This is my studio, it's a tiny studio, it's a tiny, tiny studio. I can't, this is my uh, printing table, and this is how I hang my work, and I have no, beyond, beyond the table, I have windows, so that's it, that's my studio. Israel, I'll just go here. See this work that I do with fragments, I do in fragments, and you see, and you see this work in the, uh, um, in the gallery, uh, it's very often that I see the whole work for the first time in the museums because I don't have a space to see it. I'm rubbing one part, the upper left, right part of this place as individual piece. Vestige, woodcut, missed part of this woodcut that I went on and with paint and I wrapped it and I did whatever I wanted, but it becomes a new thing. And uh, since I'm moving towards the installation, and you see here the new installation, I, um, for the Philographica project, I, uh, I wanted to come with something that is three-dimensional, yet it's not an installation yet, it comes out of the wall. wall. So this is just, for your you know, example, this is, um, a sketch, that's how I plan my things. This is how it looks in the process. And it's not finished yet. This is a hanging guide. And this is how it looks at the end. It's called If the Tread is an Echo, because echo, printmaking is an echo, and tread is an echo. Back to Titian is part of this like a uh, woodcut of the Red Sea to show you how influenced I am. This is part, this is one block of the If the Tread is an Echo from Philographica that stands independently. That's what happens when I print it five times uh, as a pattern and it starts like, you know, um, creating a new thing that is, I call it a wave. I didn't really give it a name yet. You know, this one. Uh, so this is my mother, this is a drawing, this is my mother. Um, she's beautiful, she's 87 years old. And that's how, looks, and that's how she looks when she wa uh, looked when she was 84 years old, believe it or not, she's gorgeous. Another drawing, a recent drawing, very large one. <coughs> Metzada. Masada, as you call it, excavation sites, uh, something that, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of ancient communities, as Andrea told you. It's like, you know, driving through Israel and see these, like, uh, mountains shaped like tables, and you just know there are ancient communities underneath there. 
it's amazing, and not all of it is dug because there, they, they, there is a um, uh, there is a wish to leave for the future generations uh, the possibility to dig and un and discover th their own perspective from their own perspective new things. So not all these mountains will be dug, which is a beautiful idea, I think. So this is a see, see this. Instrument, digging instrument, then that's where it appears in my etching. This is a small work. This is too, these are all etchings, aquatines, small pieces. Golan Heights, the Golan Heights, Andrea spoke about it. This is a Syrian uh, uh, building that was left from Syria. Convergence is coming up, see? That's my inspiration for Convergence. Just sites around me in Herzliya. See Convergence? You can tell. That's my studio when I was working on Convergence, full of stones called wood. Here it is when it's all put together, when it's not installed in the installation, but as one. And here I am with the sketches for the new installation. Um, I was very, very happy that Andrea uh, went with me and said, yeah, go for it. I wanted a total three-dimension um, installation that will disorient, using, still using my woodcuts. Uh, as part of it, so I didn't want to lose this craftsmanship, just doing, just installing spectacular things in, but using all the media and all my history to move forward to the new installation. So these are just sketches, and that's my rendering with a 3D designer, and you see how it looks, that's what we did in Israel, and so, and you saw what's in the gallery, and I think it came up pretty close. So that's it. <laughs>